Good morning, everyone. It is so wonderful to see everybody. So amazing to be back here. So uh, those of you that are here, please um, have a seat. We're gonna have some opening remarks from our distinguished vice president for research. Um, you don't have to sit so far away, but that's, that's okay. Uh, so yeah, really, really amazing to see everybody. I've been reflecting on the last time we met in person as a group, um, I think was here and it was Christmas uh, 20, 2019. So that was a long, long time ago and the world has changed a lot, but we've managed to accomplish a lot. And uh, so it's time for us to start coming back together. Some of you have probably been getting emails from your various deans saying, hey, September 1st, back, you know, you're back on campus. So um, we are moving towards um, getting, uh, getting back to campus and, and hopefully getting back into, uh, into, into high gear. So anyway, uh, welcome to the 2022 uh, annual uh, membership meeting. Uh, we're calling this gathering reconnections to reflect this fact that we have not been together in some time. And again, it's really amazing to see everybody. Uh, some housekeeping items. Um, please wear a mask when you're not eating or drinking or speaking at the microphone. Uh, we are keeping the windows open to get lots of ventilation. We've got coffee, we've got snacks, and uh, there's a lunch today and there's a reception today. Um, we know some of you have dietary and other restrictions, and so all the items have been labeled. Uh, there are disposable to-go boxes and cutlery available for those who want to eat outside. Um, and to the speakers and presenters today, you can load your talk at the laptop at the front here. Um, I think Mark Ferguson will have to help you because I certainly can't do that. And, um, and um, we, can, we can go from there. Uh, so I'd like to start today with our, with our recognition of, of who and where we are. As we gather here today, we acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and the Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. I'd also like to note that June is National Indigenous History Month. It's a time to recognize the rich history, the heritage, the resilience, the diversity of First Nations, Inuit and the Métis people across Canada, and June 21st is also National Indigenous Peoples Day. If my wife were here, I would have to mention that it's her birthday as well. Um, you know, one of the things that has really struck me um, almost as soon as I walked in the door here across the border into Canada is the attention and um, that and the, you know, the, the concern uh, for reconciliation and the effort that's put into reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples. Honestly, it doesn't exist um, in the United States. So it's really been refreshing to, uh, to, to see that here and to, and to understand the relationship, to learn about how Canada is doing such a wonderful job of integrating, reintegrating um, ways of knowing, looking more closely at the sacred nature of water. All this stuff is incredibly important, how the various peoples understand water, conserve it, and coexist with it. It's really um, a lesson. Um, this year at GIWS, we had the privilege of hosting several guests on the What About Water podcast who share their perspectives on what Indigenous teachings tell us about water. In honor of Indigenous History Month, if you haven't already, I, I hope you'll take a listen to this special episode featuring Janet Pitzelak Brewster. Um, she's um, MLA for uh, Akaluit Sina. Dion Hassler, who's a circuit rider, technician and trainer with the File Hills Capel Tribal Council, and Josie Street, a 23-year-old OG Cree woman belonging to the Martin clan. There's some, some um, excellent conversations and discussions there, and there, um, I think some of them are quite, quite moving. So now I'd like to say a couple of words about uh, my boss, uh, the highly accomplished researcher, educator, administrator, Dr. Beljeet Singh. Dr. Singh began his role uh, in addition to being incredibly, in addition to being an incredibly sharp dresser and a handsome man, he began his role as vice president for uh, research here in 2021 in COVID. After serving as dean of the University of Calgary Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, and then um, here at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine as uh, associate dean, Dr. Singh has received 
the 3M National Teaching Fellowship, USAC's Provost Prize for Innovative Practice of Teaching and Learning, USAC's Master Teacher Award, and the Carl J. Norton Distinguished Teacher Award. He's also received the Outstanding Veterinary Anatomist Award, which I didn't know. So I'll, we'll be discussing some animal problems later. And the American Association of Veterinary Anatomists, as well as the Pfizer Award for Research Excellence. In 2013, he was named a fellow of the American Association of Anatomists. He's here to give greetings on behalf of the university and the office of the vice president for research. Please help me welcoming Dr. Baljeet Singh. Thank you very much, uh, Jay, for uh, that introduction. Uh, uh, good morning uh, to all of you. Uh, it's quite, um, quite a remarkable morning to see so many young researchers in this room uh, that uh, creates hope that some of the most complex problems that we have uh, around water policy, social science uh, are going to be tackled and solved in the coming years. This is very clear to me looking at um, all the uh, talent in this room. Uh, when we think about water, uh, uh, th th this is fundamental to life, of course, as we say, and, um, and we look into every issue um, around the globe, quite often we can trace it back to water. And major geopolitical hotspots in the world, whether they are building of the grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam in Africa, to the issues around splitting the water that flows in the river from one boundary line to the other, uh, they typically, all these hotspots and flashpoints, which can grow into a full scale military operations between countries, they go to water. Or we look at the positive side, if we are going to think about feeding eight, nine, 10 billion people in this world, we need water for that. And the growing food in a very environmentally sustainable manner means that we have to use the water in a way that it can sustain over a long period of time. And if you are going to mine our resources, whether it is oil and uh, natural gas, or it is the uh, uranium or potash, we cannot do that without water. And, uh, and then of course, if we are going to develop our cities, grow our population, Canada has a project to have 100 million people uh, living in Canada by the end of this century. If we are going to do that, we again need lots of water uh, supply, build up, stewarding, uh, recycling, managing uh, in every shape or form. And, I just finishing living in Calgary for six years. I could not go through one conversation without somebody saying the 2013 floods and the rainfall which took place over the last four days. Again, we have to manage that piece. So essentially what the work that you do as scholars is actually is going to define how we develop as communities, as nations, and how peacefully we live and how we feed ourselves and how we develop our cities and our communities from a small town Saskatchewan to metropolis like Mumbai in India or Shanghai or Dhaka in Bangladesh. So that brings me to the point of my greetings to all of you on behalf of our president, Peter Stoichev, who always speaks about the water research at University of Saskatchewan, the number one program in the country and among the top 15 or 20 in the world this would not happen without long-standing history of research into hydrology, into fresh water at University of Saskatchewan, which is being given a totally new shape and form by the collective of the scholars that we have in this room. So really very proud of the work that you all do. I was in Bangladesh last month. This is a remarkable country and had a chance to meet with the prime minister of that country, Sheikh Hasina, uh, and also many senior leaders in the agriculture sector. 
it came clear that over the last 50 years of uh, independence of Bangladesh, which was a historic event in the Indian subcontinent, uh, about 100 million in population have been added to Bangladesh. It's a very small country. It sits at the mouth of a delta. There are cyclones which come from Bay of Bengal. But they have, through sheer ingenuity and hard work, have grown their agriculture to a level where they have grain sufficiency for their population. But the pressing point is water now. They are losing 1% of their agriculture land uh, to urbanization, to salinity, and to variety of other factors. Of course, our agriculture scientist and Global Institute for Food Security is engaged there. Dr. J. Familiati have been there. Dr. Plash Samyal have been there, of course. And what do we do there? How do we work with them in a collaborative manner that the science you develop here goes to help in far off places, not only about the policy as to how we share and use water, but how do we steward the whole resource, fresh water, lakes, oceans, all put together. So if we are going to sustain the population in places like India, Bangladesh, or other countries, your work is going to matter a lot. So this science that you do and the educational programs you develop using the new tools of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and you influence the policy first at home, then somewhere else is the way University of Saskatchewan has done its work over more than 115 years of its history. We talk about rankings all the time. I'm not a big fan of rankings, but if there are rankings, I would like to be among the top for my colleagues to be among there. The latest rankings of Times Higher Education, which I firmly believe are the only meaningful rankings out of QS, AWRU, and McLean's, because Times Higher Education rankings are aligned with the sustainable development goals of United Nations. So those rankings measure how universities are influencing sustainability around the globe in alignment with the 17 SDGs. And I have always believed having been at University of Saskatchewan for more than 20 years in one way or the other, that we do very well in those rankings. We are number 58 globally among 1400 universities in THE impact rankings. Now, if you think about sustainability, again, we come to the water, we come to food production, we come to environment, climate change, social development, indigenization, how do we work with people? That's where I believe University of Saskatchewan excels and it will continue to excel in that area because Times Higher Education impact rankings, whatever you take them for, actually do speak to the impact of the universities on creating sustainability in the community's development, in the resources that we have, in the educational programs, in the climate change and water, food, energy, everything we do. And that's where the heft of the University of Saskatchewan comes to play at home and abroad. So the work that we do across the sector in an interdisciplinary setting, water, food, energy, indigenization, is going to create even more of an impact for a university which is needed by the world every day more and more. If you look at the trade offices that this province is opening to export the food, uranium, potash, around the world, we cannot do that without the science that our water researchers are going to develop. So coming back to the work that you do is of vital importance uh, to this university and to the world that needs every discovery you make uh, in, in a very meaningful way. So I congratulate all of you for the work you do. It's not easy work. It's a very complex scholarly work that you do, but the only way we can be impactful is through collaboration, interdisciplinarity, sharing the knowledge and learning from wherever we need to learn from, whether it is the indigenous communities or a scholar sitting in Dhaka, Bangladesh, or somewhere else. So bringing that knowledge together and creating a body of knowledge that is going to create sustainability is the key here. So I again congratulate you on taking on this very complex global challenge of water security and creating your contribution to that piece. And I am appreciative of the work that Jay does as a leader of this institute and the support that university provides to water as a signature area is the key. 
Dr. John Pomeroy and others have been in the news for last five days during the massive rainfall because the modeling work that University of Saskatchewan researchers do along with uh, uh, Dr. Martin Clark and Jeff uh, um, McDonald and Sherry Westbrook, Helen Balch, Corinne Schuster Wallace and everybody else. It's amazing work that you all do. Global Water Futures Program, amazing success story. And Sir Create that Jay has just received funding for will create another six year long training program at the heels of the one that Dr. Sherry Westbrook had to have two and Sir Creates back to back focused on water tells that how deeply respectful NSERC is of the work that happens at University of Saskatchewan when it comes to education of the next generation of leaders um, at, uh, at, in the area of water, which is very dear to my heart because I love teaching, I enjoy it. And, uh, um, and so I'm very appreciative of that leadership Jay has shown in bringing funding for an NSERC create in that area. So I close by again, thanking all of you and giving me the opportunity uh, to be here this morning and uh, and to um, and to see you all my best wishes thank you thanks so much dr singh really appreciate it and um, um so your comments were so comprehensive and reflective that i really don't have anything left to say um, no, that's not true at all. I have a whole presentation, but the food was delivered late. And so I think what we want to do is just take like a five minute break. If for those of you who want to get up and get some food, it's basically breakfast food. I saw some fruit back there. So let's just uh, take five minutes, uh, get some food, get some coffee, and uh, then I'll give my presentation and we'll get started with the days, with the rest of the day's presentations. Thanks. There we go. So nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I want to give some, um, you know, set the stage, talk about some of the things that have been going on in the Institute, but really to follow up on what Professor Singh was talking about. I don't know how well this one shows up, but this is my standard, um, uh, actually the updated version of our uh, NASA gravity recovery and climate experiment uh, satellite data. And this really speaks to um, the issues that Dr. Singh was talking about, which is, you know, how do we do our research and have an impact uh, here at home and, you know, in, in Saskatchewan and Saskatoon and Canada and then around the world? Because when you look around the world, it's a pretty complex place. So um, the colors there, this, this is 20 years of data from the NASA GRACE mission. And the red colors are places that are losing water. By the way, the ice sheets are left, left off. They're sort of calculated separately, but they're the, the biggest losers. So the reds are places that are losing water and um, the blues are places that are, that are gaining water. And, and um, there's a real structure to this, to this map. And you know, we've written papers on it. There's a nature paper from 2018 and there's another one called uh, some explainer piece called the map of the future of water that explains it. Um, in a sort of a um, translation translation mode, science translation mode, but there's a background pattern there that shows, or at least until recently, showed the wet areas getting wetter, the high latitudes and the low latitudes getting wetter, the mid latitudes getting drier, and sprinkled on top of that all these hot spots for too much or too little water, and those hot spots are places like you know Alaska where the glaciers are melting or Patagonia. Um, and of course, the ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica are melting away. There's places for interannual variability. So where flooding and drought is starting to show up and we know these extremes are increasing. Um, and then there's the groundwater depletion, which is something that I've worked on quite a bit. And so, you know, on every continent uh, in the United States, um, um, the Central Valley and the High Plains Aquifer in the Middle East, the Arabian Peninsula and Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Caspian Sea region, um, North China Plain, the Pilbara region in, in Australia, Southern Africa, the Huarni Africa, uh, the Huarni Aquifer in South America. So really on, on every continent, this is happening. And so, um, you know, this is a really compelling picture. It's one I think uh, we need to work hard on addressing and, and wrapped up in here, there's of course a lot of social, economic, uh, political issues. What is not in here is the water quality issues. When you throw the water quality issues on here, uh, it, there's a little bit of equity issues embedded in here, but when you factor all those things in, 
you've got a lot of a lot of things to uh, a lot of things to really worry about. And so here's uh, here's Canada. I don't know if the uh, uh animations are going to work that well oh yeah here we are so yeah gulf of alaska so these are the time series now so they up the monthly values the ups and downs and the long-term trends over the last 20 years so you know not not looking great that's sort of like the athabasca region uh of course you get up to nunavut you're getting close to greenland all that's melting away so you know there's a lot of red there in canada that that um makes sense and um St. Lawrence increasing. I think the Great Lakes are, I don't have a Great Lakes chart in there, but Great Lakes are, are increasing. And here's, here's our home, right? And so we've got this uh, increase up until about whatever, 20, 2012, oh, sorry, about 2018 or so. And then kind of a decrease really depends on, on how you look at it, but a little bit more, more variability there. Um, so it's a really intense picture globally. And I think for me, this has really driven a lot of my research and thinking about exactly what Professor Singh said, how can we make an impact here in Canada? How can, we, how can we make an impact in our city, in our province, in Canada, and around the world? How can you go? He used a great example. We've written this into proposals. How does a group of university scientists or maybe a transdisciplinary group, how do you go over to Bangladesh or to, um, or to the Punjab region in India? Or how do you, you know, have conversations in, in China or, or um, you know, in, in Malaysia, it's really difficult. Um, I don't know the answers, but I think we really have to work on that and figure out how we can make an impact because there is a real urgency here, right? So the pace and the scale of these problems require urgent solutions. And that's what I hope that, that we, can, we can work on. So our vision, so, you know, we spent uh, end of 2020 and most of 2021 revisioning and thinking about where we wanted to go for the, for the next 10 years. And what came out of it was a vision that looks something like this, global water security solutions uh, and accelerated efforts towards climate adaptation achieved through interdisciplinary research, science-informed policy, and transdisciplinary engagement. And it's that last piece that I think is really important because these two, these problems are too big to be tackled just by universities, just by interdisciplinary teams and just by teams of universities, okay? So we really need to make those connections in government with NGOs, with civil society, okay? Has to, has to be done and we're, we're not gonna get where we need to be. And so our mission statement uh, looks something like this to conduct world-class innovative interdisciplinary water research that drives transformative solutions. So very much solutions oriented adaptation strategies locally, nationally, and globally to provide enriching graduate student and postdoctoral training experiences to prepare HQ, HQP to confidently confront the complexities of water and related issues in their chosen professions to engage deeply in transdisciplinary collaborative partnerships at all levels to co-develop solutions and adaptation oriented research projects to communicate our results broadly to advise governments and to participate in water diplomacy and to affect sustainable water management and policy and to mentor the next generation of leadership in water research and practice. And so thankfully we have a powerful institute here that's well supported by the university, that's well supported by federal funding. Um, and so we're in a great position to to tackle these things moving forward, many of you know these are some of the areas where we've been working through the years, some of our focus themes, climate change and water security. I'm gonna go counterclockwise, land water management and environmental change. Water and health has really emerged over the last few years. Groundwater and hydrogeology is something that we hope to grow and we're writing a new frontiers proposal on global groundwater sustainability. Water and wastewater treatment and technology is always uh, strong and certainly always strong on the, um, uh, toxicology side and, and socio-hydrology and sustainable development of natural resources is, you know, at the end of the day, Canada and Saskatchewan, you know, it's a research nation, uh, sorry, a resource based nation and uh, resource driven province. And so I think that we have a responsibility to work to help develop those resources sustainably. Okay, that's what it's all about, finding that balance or growing food and the transition to, to clean energy 
Um, these things have to be done in a sustainable way. We can't say, no, we're not gonna work with, you know, with industry. We really have a responsibility to work with industry to help them do better because at the end of the day, industry uses all the water, right? Industry uses eight, like 80% of all the water that's withdrawn from rivers and from, from groundwater. So to turn a blind eye to it means we won't have an impact on, on global water security. We did some self-evaluation and we decided that our strengths were, of course, modeling, field-based research, cold regions, we're Canada, cold region science, uh, toxicology, interdisciplinary and indigenous engagement, climate change and water security, but strategic opportunities for growth, water, food, energy, environment, nexus. And so we've been submitting many proposals on this. Water policy and diplomacy, water quality, groundwater, remote sensing, corporate water use and industry engagement, integrating our field sites uh, into a network and water and health uh, and water and humanity, basically following on this SDG um, path that, uh, that uh, Dr. Singh was, was, was talking about. Oops, that was me who did that. I, I pushed the wrong button. Uh, okay, good, we're back. So some strategic near-term priorities for the Institute. We started, I think, about a year ago, and I think we dropped the ball on this campus-wide coordination on water degree programs. We got to the point where we were actually having conversations with the provost's office. But many of us in the Institute feel that the research is great, but the campus-wide programs can be better and can help us attract the best uh, graduate students. And so that's a, you know, that's a prayer to this second bullet. Building a stronger international reputation. So, you know, we do that individually, and we do that, and we do that collectively. Part of that is going to the right meetings. Part of that is establishing the right collaborations. Uh, Dr. Singh mentioned the work with Bangladesh. Uh, we just submitted another proposal with Bangladesh and India. We've done a lot of work. You know, our, our colleagues in the institute work all over work all over the world. Uh, maybe we need to do a better job messaging on that, but also maybe bringing in some other large uh, international proposals will will help. Sustaining elements of the Global Order Futures Program. Actually, we just had our uh, MSI um, uh, funded, which is the infrastructure for the uh, for the field site. So that's so that's fantastic. Uh, we've been talking about, of course, you know, doing more fundraising, including advancement. And the Office of Vice President for Research has actually hired. This is right, Terry, someone who will work just with the just with the institute. So. I have a meeting coming up on that at the end of the month, which will be fantastic. We've talked about an interdisciplinary uh, prairie resilience center, kind of like a climate change adaptation center. Started with some ideas about doing this in Canmore and then migrated to the prairies. Deep engagement with GIFs, Ag Bio, SANS, engineering on the food, water, energy nexus, which we continue to, to work on. The CRC tier one actually circulating some emails on that. We had gone for someone in snow remote sensing and, um, and he withdrew from the process and now we're focused on soil moisture and that is um, documents being, being circulated with some of the deans. Deeper engagement with the policy and social sciences. I think it's time for us to probably do a workshop on that, on that topic. Uh, National Global Groundwater Program. And so this I think will be led by the work that we're doing um, for this new frontiers proposal will help set the, set the stage on that. Water quality and better connections with uh, toxicology I think would be really important. And science communication is something that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, I don't think we can impact things on a uh, regional and global basis. Uh, you know, think about those maps that I that I showed you. Just staying in the ivory tower and just writing our research papers. We have to write our research papers, and we have to do a great job. We have to do the best that we can. They have to be peer reviewed. But you know, we need to take extra steps, and the institute can help do that. Write translation pieces. Write opinion pieces. There are a lot of a lot of places where we can publish blog posts, we can even post things on our website. We've done a great job, Outreach has done a great job with some of the science news pieces. So doing that translation piece is really, really important so that people know what we're doing, but also so that the people who need to know actually know like what we've done, how we can, how we can help them. Sometimes that comes down to personal, personal visits. And that's something the Institute can help, um, can help with. Um, I'll talk about this series partnership uh, later. Um, so many of you have seen this um, uh, timeline before. I think we've done uh, just you know incredible growth over the last 
um, 10 years. And so some of the high points here, I won't go through them. We just need to add some new high points on here, like the new Create was funded, the MSI was funded. These are, you know, these are major programs. Um, and I assume that, uh, or I hope that we'll have other new circles to add on here in the in the years to in the years to come. Um, so by the numbers, we've got about 400 members um, um, across campus, including 94 faculty members from 21 units, 718 graduate students trained, 181 postdocs, 639 research associates. We've attracted almost now it's over 300 million. Um, and that's separate from, from GWF, which is his own pot of money, which was, I think, ultimately ended up to be like 100 million to, to USASC and, and 275 for the whole program. Tons of publications. So having impact and, you know, from time to time, Fanny will show us some of the um, uh, citations that our faculty are, are generating. And, it, and it, looks, it looks really good. Some really important... Um, Focus areas for us, decolonization, indigenization. In fact, uh, Graham, I think, just took a trip to, uh, to the Delta. And so we have researchers, uh, many researchers, ones that come to mind are, are Graham Strickard and Lori Bradford and Tim Jardine, but, but, but many others that are working to co-develop uh, you know, in the community, in the communities, um, working to co-develop projects um, and really engage in uh, in a meaningful way that you know I said in my introductory remarks doesn't really happen in the United States. So I'm very proud to be learning from you about how to do this how to do this properly. EDI is really at the core of our mission. We've been rolling out, so we've been working with uh, Dr. Andrea Rowe, who's been leading us through this. She did a great job um, uh, setting up the EDI. Uh, program for Global Water Futures, and then she's adapted it, and we've had some uh, some open sessions, some discussion sessions, and and now rolling it out for uh, for the institute. Um, and so I think that's been uh, a great a great success. Awesome job. Um, so you know we work hard to develop these outside partners, and here's a few that are that are listed, and I'm actually. Quite proud of some of the smaller scale work that uh, that we've been doing, and Palash has been trying to set up projects for us um, with the city. And some of you already work with the city, so I think that's, you know, I think you have to pay your dues at home, and you know, also show that we. I mean, I like to show that I really care about the place, the place that I that I live. I think it's really important that the institute has a footprint here, and it, you know, it it cares about it cares about the city as well as as well as the globe. Um, so um, anyway, we've got tons of partners and uh, just want to highlight the series one that we had a separate slide on. So that series is um, um, a sustainability nonprofit, Boston based, and they work with investors to drive uh, uh, sustainability, environmental sustainability. And they've done a lot of work on carbon and climate change, and we've been working with them on water. So we released a big report that came out in early April called the Global Assessment of Private Sector Impact uh, on Water. So we assembled a big team here, work with Siri. So it was a great opportunity to work hand in hand uh, with a nonprofit to do things on their timeline, to you know publish things in their in their format. Um, and so now we get the opportunity to see, like, does it work? The, uh, the idea is, you know, we looked at the different industry sectors and the major risks to industry and the major impacts by, by industry, by sectors. So food, you know, food and beverage, apparel, mining, and so on. And so the idea is that investors will take that information and then go to, you know, a certain company and say, hey, we're not going to invest in you unless you do this with respect to water, unless you have board level representation of water sustainability, unless you stop you know, this particular process if, or stop depleting this aquifer if, if such circumstances can be identified. So a lot of fun, a lot of research opportunities there to understand how to do the accounting, what the standards should be, what the metrics are, and the efficacy of something like that, say, a, a, versus a, you know financial intervention versus policy intervention. So lots of lots of good work. So these are awards we didn't get to announce last year. Uh, so the Water Security Research Excellence Award last year, which are held in uh, Helen Balch and Lee Wilson, and best PhD thesis to Razi, and I won't even attempt Razi's last name, but I see him on Twitter. Um, 
And um, anyway, so that was last year and the new awards will be announced uh, at the end of the day. So, so that'll be fun. So stick around for that. And this is way too small to, for me to read, but lots of um, different awards um, and recognitions and I won't read it. Um, and I assume we'll make these slides available. Actually, this will be in the annual report. Actually, no, it's not an annual report, it's an annual magazine. I believe the annual magazine paper copy will be available here today, is available here, is available here. Unlike the hats, is available today. Lori Bradford has been named Canada Research Chair Tier 2 in Social and Cultural Decision-Making in Engineering Design. That is completely awesome. And um, if we could toast uh, right now, I would, but it's probably bad, bad form. You know, the wastewater team, the COVID team with, um, um, uh, with Kerry and Marcus and, and John Giese, I mean, those guys, you know, you've seen it happening in the news and on the website and everything. They've just been, they've just been ripping it up and winning the engagement award and, and just getting a lot of recognition, both Marcus and the team. So we're super, super proud of them. Jeff, AAAS fellow, awesome job, buddy. Some mention of some accordion something something by Jeff this afternoon talk. Palash, uh, Sanyal, uh, USASC alumni went to watch award winner, distinguished alumni recently. Plush is like on the hot list for awards. So I can't even, I think there's like at least another one there. But we had the honor to go to the Distinguished Alumni uh, banquet with Palash as his guest. And Palash was like maybe the youngest guy on the on the on the podium there. There were so which is a testament to how much he's accomplished in a short amount of time because these are like career, you know, career-based awards. So so we're proud of you. Um, so this could be one of my last slides. So, you know, we, we want to mobilize, you know, more solutions oriented work. We want to mobilize work on groundwater, on the food water nexus, on, on remote sensing. And so we am announcing today that we have at least $800,000 that we will be um, awarding in fellowships and grants and fellowships. Um, and on some of these selected topics, some of that money's coming from my research chair. So the topics need to be closer to to things that I've written about in my in my chair proposal. So groundwater sustainability, food water nexus, remote sensing, science communication, water diplomacy. Um, we're also talking about a couple of postdoctoral fellowships. And the third thing we're talking about, which we have not worked out yet, is to work with CGPS to add more money to this. So I just talked to Professor Singh about this like on Wednesday. Uh, so I haven't had a chance to follow up. No, on Tuesday, I haven't had a chance to follow up with CGPS but look into the idea of them adding money to this, matching some of this money so we can broaden it and it doesn't have to be just these. So looking at getting this up to a million or maybe even 1.2 million. So, so stay tuned on that because it's a way to really jumpstart, I think after our reconnections and, and you know, we've done this visioning and we're focused on solutions orientation and now it's time, I think to get some money into your hands to, uh, to start some projects and these things, you know, the idea is of course you write papers, you start new collaborations and then you go off and write proposals that we can, that we can help you, that we can help you write. Uh, I'll just skip over this since we haven't really worked out the details. Podcast, many of you know, we do uh, a podcast called, uh, called What About Water? You know, the podcast surprisingly uh, is, do, is doing pretty well. Um, and I say surprisingly because I'm the host and I just assume no one wants to listen to me. Uh, it's the end of our, uh, is it our fourth season or end of our third season? I think it's the end of our third season. Third season. Um, so yeah, lots of people listen to it. It's actually the top water podcast. No, it's the top. See, you can always say you're the top in something if you refine the niche small enough. So if you get down to water science podcast, we're definitely the top water science, fresh water, not salt water, fresh water science podcast in North America, possibly the world, but definitely North America. Um, so it's doing great. We've, and I mentioned before, um, when we were talking about um, uh, indigenous and first nations uh, interactions, we've had a lot of good guests and we learned a lot of, we learned a lot of stuff and hopefully broadened awareness of some of those problems. Uh, through through the podcast. You know, we've done a lot of stuff uh, over the last year. 
So the CFI, MSI, you know, we wanted to network our sites together and we got the MSI fund. We just found out like yesterday. So that's fantastic. We want to do more food water work. We got the CREATE funded and, and we have other proposals that, we're, that we've been working on. We wanted to get water as a signature area renewed and we were successful with that in that. The New Frontiers proposal actually was an extremely competitive letter of intent process. I forgot what it was. Fanny knows the numbers, like 178 or something submissions and 25 got through and 10 to 15 will be funded. So we think a really good chance of getting funded. The tier, the CRC tier one and remote sensing, that's we're talking with the deans and directors about that. Uh, we will be talking once our, uh, advancement person arrives in OVPR, we will begin talking about the Prairie Resilience Center because I think that'll be a nice target for funding. And we've got to get back to our coordinated teaching discussions, uh, but we have done a lot of outreach with, um, with What About Water. Um, we were supposed to have our water day on the hill again, um, it just got postponed until the fall. This is where we brought, last time we did this just before COVID, 25 water scientists to parliament, to Ottawa, to meet with, uh, with MPs. Um, and it was a great opportunity in science communication. Got our science communication micro-credential with SANS, irrigation micro-credential with ag bio and engineering in the work, um, and some of the new strategic partnerships that, that we mentioned. We're making great progress. As Belgique mentioned, we are, um, number one in Canada and number 15 in the world. So that's, you know, a big jump from up five, you know, in a period of a year is, is really awesome. And thank you very much. Um, and in the interest of time, Mark, is your recommendation that we slide right into our student talks? Yes, I got the thumbs up. Okay, so uh, we're gonna be hearing some talks from our student members. Uh, so it's pretty exciting to hear what everyone's been up to. Each talk will be 10 minutes. So we're going to do, let's see, before our break, we're going to do one, two, three, four, five talks. Um, so we'll have five talks, um, 10 minutes total. So five or six minutes, and then a few minutes for questions. Uh, we've got a floor mic for questions. So please act, ask, that's not a floor mic, that's a floor mic. Uh, if you spoke into that thing, you'd look pretty silly. Um, Maybe during the reception, we can try that. A floor mic for questions. Please ask your question at the microphone because otherwise those on Zoom won't be able to hear it. Um, we're gonna jump between talks quickly. Am I the, I'm the enforcer for that for now in the first session? Okay. Remember Jeff with the hockey stick? That's what we need. Uh, so first up is uh, Yuri Anasimov. Yuri Anasimov. Yuri, how do I say your last name? Uh, Anisimov. Thank you so much, Yuri. Why don't you come on up here? And I think maybe if you do this, just is your are your Yuri slides up here? Uh, yep, they are. Oh, you're gonna do it? I'm gonna get it out of the way. Yeah, thank you. All right, so good morning, everyone. I am glad to see such a big audience here. So, dear colleagues, uh, I would like to present uh, my work today, this is my research work uh, about hybrid biopolymer composites uh, for humidity sensing. So here is a brief outline of my work. Uh, first of all, I would like to talk about the uh, uh, choice of components for the humidity sensing materials. Uh, so basically I'm looking for uh, sustainable, renewable, uh, eco-friendly materials um, and if you look at uh, these two uh, components which uh, are chitosan and polyaniline so chitosan actually meets uh, these requirements of sustainability so this 
composites are basically hybrid made from one syn synthetic polymer, which is polyanilin, uh, pani, and another one is a uh, chitosan. So here you see the uh, chemical structure of pani, and basically uh, this is the uh, core uh, component for humidity sensing materials since it uh, possesses the intrinsic conductivity. Um, and it's already used like a precursor material for numerous electronic devices, uh, including humidity sensors. So for chitosan, for example, chitosan, uh, like a biomaterial, it has um, uh, a wide range of a wide range uh, of um, uh, use. Uh, so it's used, for example, for water treatment, for wound dressing, for tissue engineering, food packaging, and the sensors actually is a novel direction. Uh, I have seen quite a few publications on chitosan, uh, using chitosan for sensing materials. So basically, uh, this is my purpose to uh, develop this field and to, to contribute to this field. Uh, and why chitosan in addition to PANI? Because it's actually hygroscopic, for example, uh, Pani it has a conductivity, but its uh, hydrophilicity and hygroscopicity uh, is not that uh, large. So chitosan would actually make up for this uh, uh, for this uh, gap. All right. So uh, I am creating a composite. So a composite material that's something new with unique properties. Uh, and these properties should be different uh, relative to the properties of single components. Uh, this is basically a picture of uh, my sensing film, uh, which I will uh, talk about uh, a few minutes later. Uh, so I did some measurements, uh, uh, namely mechanical testing and uh, humidity sensing. Uh, conductivity measurements uh, and response to uh, humidity uh, because uh, basically the sensing mechanism uh, of a sensor is um, based on change in conductivity at different uh, humidity values and um, the sen sensing material should uh, conform to uh, two requirements actually uh, should be mechanically stable should be electrically conductive uh, so mechanical stability because of its deformations, possible deformations under the variable humidity uh, and conductivity for the reason that it should con convey somehow a uh, humidity response. Uh, so here you see the equipment uh, which I used to uh, actually to provide mechanical measurements uh, and electrical measurements. So uh, mechanical tests were done with the aid of tensile tester. Uh, and it basically uh, measures force versus elongation. And then from the force, I could derive uh, stress values, which is force over cross-sectional area, uh, and strain values, which is actually relative elongation to the length of the specimen, and then plot the stiffness. And according to the stiffness, uh, figure out the mechanical uh, tensile strengths of a material. Uh, for electrical measurements, there are actually two methods to do that. So uh, two terminal sensing and four terminal sensing. Uh, I use four terminal sensing for a circular probe, uh, which allowed me uh, to measure uh, resistivity and then conductivity as inverse resistivity of that. Uh, so uh, for actually for a circular shape, uh, it is established that the diameter of shape does not uh, affect conductivity, but only the thickness. Thickness of the material was a crucial thing. In my case, it was between 0 0.3 and one millimeter. So here you see the results uh, of both uh, mechanical and electrical measurements. So this red uh, curves uh, for mechanical measurement, they correspond to 25% uh, uh, Pani, 75% Kytosan, uh, samples and actually how you can estimate its properties looking at these curves uh, we see that um, the slope which is actually a black line on the graph the slope uh, is the highest for 25% pani uh, materials 
um, you see upper graph, which is in a dry state and the lower graph, which is in a wet state. So I tested both because I need to know the response towards humidity. Um, the trends actually are similar if we take different ratios of um, Pani and Kytosan. Um, so 25% Pani, 75 Kytosan actually the best in terms of mechanical properties. We see that Kytosan provides a reinforcement for the materials and that's good. Uh, and the length of this curve. So you see that it's uh, sort of this curve it bends. So what happens after bending, uh, material becomes ductile. So this is a ductile region. And we again see that the most ductile material is with 25% uh, pani and the stiffest material is with 25% pani. So that's basically one with remarkable mechanical properties. If we go to sensing, which is on the right here, we see that uh, when the humidity goes to higher levels, like uh, more than 60%, uh, then the humidity response drastically increases. Uh, and that's uh, due to chitosan, which is uh, absorbs uh, uh, pretty much moisture. Uh, and here we actually see that uh, according to the compositions, 25% uh, pani, well, it uh, shows the lowest uh, conductivity. Um, because pani is electrically conductive polymer, so if we reduce it, so conductivity drops. But with 75% pani, we have the highest conductivity and the best uh, humidity response. If we look at the numbers uh, in the table in, in the right bottom, uh, we see that um, actually the composites become 100% more uh, 100 times more conductive in wet state. So that's an excellent uh, response to humidity, which is um, actually even not characteristic for many ceramic sensors. Um, uh, but for biopolymer-based sensors, this value was achieved. So in conclusion, I would say that um, basically pani chitosan composites are uh, suitable for humidity sensing. In terms of mechanical uh, uh, strengths, it's 25% pani. In terms of uh, uh, sensitivity and uh, uh, conductive, uh, conductive properties, it's 75% pani. So these composites are promising sensor materials and this field um, can be developed further uh, because again, biopolymers are sustainable. So they're recyclable, they're renewable. Uh, although, um, for example, these pani chitosan composites are not brought to the commercial level yet, but uh, due to their promising properties, uh, they will be brought uh, in a foreseeable future, I believe in that. Um, because now actually we are using mostly uh, ceramic sensors. Ceramic sensors are rigid, uh, so they're not that flexible. And biosensors, uh, I mean, biocomposite sensors, they're flexible. So humidity response is, is good. So basically the future is after uh, biocomposite based uh, sensors. And that actually connects also to uh, global water security in terms of uh, that humidity actually uh, is uh, an intrinsic property of uh, environmental air. So we need to measure it for different purposes uh, to control, for example, to monitor weather, to uh, control humidity in different premises uh, um, for storing food, for storing some uh, pieces of art, for storing some other uh, maybe uh, electronic devices or so. So, uh, and I would like to acknowledge in this research first, first uh, my group and my two supervisors, uh, which are over there, uh, who helped me all, all the time with this project. Uh, and of course, uh, the Global Institute for Water Security that uh, hosted me and uh, allowed me to say a few words about my project. So thank you very much for your attention. Any questions so far? Thank you. Yeah. So sorry, no, no time for questions. So great way, greatest strategy. Um, if you don't want to ask questions, if you don't want to be asked any questions, just use the entire 10 minutes. So uh, Loza is up next.
Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for um, accepting me to uh, present this uh, presentation. Actually, I'm not, I'm kind of different from Yuri because uh, I'm just starting my PhD. Uh, but I want to talk about uh, chemical modification of biomass fibers uh, in order to use in filtration application. Uh, as you might all be familiar, uh, there are different types of pollutants that can uh, negatively affect on uh, both human life and also animal lives. Okay, uh, mm, there are different sources uh, of pollutant, but if we want to categorize this pollutant, we can uh, mention outdoor and indoor pollutant. Uh, the first one is uh, mm, such, uh, such as um, burning fossil fuels or chemical waste. And the second one might be uh, not familiar with most of us because uh, when we are at home, maybe we are not uh, aware of different types of pollutants such as uh, cigarette smoke, uh, dust and dust mites, and also uh, cleaning products, which are really important for our health and also uh, natural gases that we use for cooking or some other sources. Uh, these kinds of pollutants can uh, cause many health problems such as um, a stroke, uh, acute and chronic respiratory disease, heart disease, and so forth. Okay, in order to, um, in order to just uh, overcome all of these um, limitations and health problems, uh, this, the simplest way is to use uh, filters, air filters. There are different types of filters available uh, commercially. Uh, the most important one is um, HEPA filters. Uh, you might be familiar with HEPA filters. They are high, high efficiency uh, particulate air filters. And also they, there are um, porous filters, uh, fibrous filters, and also activated carbon filters. But today I want to talk about my project, which is uh, fibrous filters. And there are two types of fibrous filters that we can made of. Um, the first one to use natural fibers such as wool, cotton, silk, and et cetera, in order to make a filter. And the second way is to use uh, synthetic fibers such as uh, glass fibers, polypropylene, uh, acrylic fibers, or polyester or polyamide uh, fibers. But uh, the thing is that we can chemically modify the um, fiber in order to increase the efficiency of the filter. Uh, there are different ways in order to modify a filter, a fiber in a filter. First of all, we can use a coating such as deep coating or a spray coating. The second way is to um, graft a polymer on the surface of the fiber in order to increase the filtration efficiency. Or maybe we can use plasma in order to change the hydrophilicity or, or hydrophobicity uh, nature of the fiber in a filter and increase the filtration efficiency. Okay, so there are different uh, um, studies have been done uh, in regard to uh, change the chemistry of the fibers in uh, in a, in a filter. Uh, I'm going to uh, mention to two of them. The first one, um, Liu and his colleagues uh, worked on uh, functionalizing cotton fiber with zane uh, protein and also using uh, zane nanofibers um, in order to increase the filtration efficiency of uh, cotton fiber-based filters. So uh, by this way, they increase the, uh, the absorbance of the pollutant by the cotton uh, fiber. And uh, the second uh, study was done by uh, he and his colleagues. They used and manufact they used cotton fiber as the base material and manufacture a bilayered uh, composite made of cotton fiber as the base material and also modified them with um, silver and zinc nanofibers and also um, uh, attach some nanofibers such as polystyrene nanofibers uh, on top of the cotton 
and they achieved two goals. The first goal was um, increasing the uh, antimicrobial activity of the fiber. And the second goal was uh, they achieved high filtration efficiency and low pressure drop in order to uh, uh, make the air more cleaner. And they used uh, this filter in order to uh, protect human, uh, such as masks, in order to protect from uh, micro microbes and viruses. Okay, uh, so there are different things that we can do in the future, um, as well as the first thing that we can use, we can use other sources of natural fibers, uh, such as uh, jute, hemp, flax, or uh, etc. Also, we can uh, use uh, different types of fi uh, fibers, natural fibers, or a combination of natural and synthetic fibers in order to increase the filtration efficiency. Second, uh, third of all, we can use woven or non-woven uh, filters. We can uh, fabricate them and uh, comparize with uh, the commercial filter. We can electrostatically modify uh, the chemistry of the, of the fiber in a filter in order to capture more uh, pollutant from air because some of the pollutant uh, can have charge. And uh, if the surface of the fiber had the opposite charge, they can attract more pollutants. But uh, maybe all of you might think, what is the relationship between my topic and to, uh, to the water sources or water treatment? So we can, if we can able to use other sources of natural fibers, which are abundantly available in the nature, we can use a really good source of material to, um, to fabricate a filter in which has some application in water treatment, such as uh, purification or separation oil from water or dye from water or uh, making just the wastewater uh, clean to, to be used. Uh, thank you so, so much for your attention. If you have any questions, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Next, I think uh, Mustafa's next. Okay, uh, so I want you to look at this picture and remember it. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mustafa Kamal, and I'm a fourth year PhD student uh, supervised by Professor Yan Ping Lee. So, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a type of thunderstorms, which is called supercell. And I just shown a picture, so which is a typical example of a supercell. So, let me tell you now, you are here today and you park your car outside. And I'm sure not all of you park your car inside the stadium park, park it, which is indoor. And now all of a sudden you hear a severe thunderstorms warning or watch. And you hear over your broadcast TV that you are supposed to get a hail of like this size in one hour. So please raise your hand, how many of you will get scared about your car parked outside? 
exactly so i am going to study like i am studying a type of thunderstorms that produce this size of hail hurricane force wind and uh, like uh, extreme lightning and as well as uh, the flash flooding so my study uh, is covering uh, three different kind of uh, supercell so as you can see from this picture uh, in uh, two opposite spectrum in one spectrum it is called lp supercell which is low precipitation supercell in the opposite spectrum it is uh, called hp supercell or high precipitation supercell and the middle it is called classic supercell and these three different type of supercell form under different environmental condition so uh, and all three types of supercell require four key ingredient one is wind like a directional change of wind and as well as like the changing wind speed with altitude uh, different kind of uh, instability which we call uh, that how a parcel of air is uh, warmer compared to its environment and the third is need a moisture and as we know that as the global uh, warming uh, is continue uh, the moisture uh, the holding capacity of the atmosphere is increasing so these are uh, uh, four ingredient needed uh, this uh, to form this supercell and during the summer time uh, this supercell form occasionally over the canadian prairies and this is really also important like as i mentioned that these three different supercell is interchangeable so uh, it start uh, with when the wind shear uh, like at the beginning of the spring season when the moisture is very low it forms the lp supercell and at the end of the summer uh, like in uh, july uh, we get uh, this hp supercell and as you know i think that last year uh, it was one of the driest year in canada's history like 20 years and typically you know, the manitoba province received nine hp supercell in last year it received only three and uh, so these three supercell also differ uh, not only in physical structure but also in a, this is the schematic diagram of these three different type of supercell and they differ also in a, a schematically and this is the internal structure now so this is uh, now I, I think uh, by the time you are now uh, it should be clear that uh, why i'm studying and why it is important uh, to study these three different type of supercell over the canadian prairies and uh, which I uh, like one thing I have uh, discussed that the supercell is responsible for producing 75% of the tornado over the Canada. And you know that uh, the Canada, uh, in terms of number of tornado, Canada ranks seven, followed by the US. So this is also important. And as I just showing that, okay, uh, last year well, it was one of the driest year. And this is one of the reasons because we received only just three uh, HP supercell over the Manitoba instead of the nine uh, on average. So I have two research objectives uh, principally. So I wanted to understand uh, the how, what are the environmental conditions that uh, favor this development of these three different type of supercell. And the second thing is I wanted to develop a comprehensive climatology that uh, under what uh, environmental condition this supercell forms and how it will change under future climate conditions. So, uh, so I. Uh, like uh, my data methodology is a little uh, different than uh, the conventional one. Uh, unfortunately, we have very limited number of data over the Canada. And so specifically like a radio sounding, like which we collect uh, by releasing the balloon, uh, uh, weather balloons. Unfortunately, there is no uh, weather balloon release from the province of Saskatchewan, and only two from the province of Alberta and uh, three from, I think two from uh, Manitoba. So. So I make some friendship or uh, collaboration with a uh, professional uh, storm chaser uh, who have been chasing this storm for uh, 10 to 15 years. So I get data from them. And so this, specifically this picture. And then I uh, look at it, uh, the satellite uh, picture and find that okay, the particular type of uh, storm structure from the satellite images. As you can see, this is a, uh, like a, a schematic diagram and this is the real uh, image uh, and this picture is take uh, this uh, specifically this uh, supercell uh, produces a three tornado on uh, i think uh, july 4 2020 and uh, over the saskatchewan and then i look at it uh, this uh, storm structure over the radar uh, and then try to find that okay that typical uh, characteristics of different supercell uh, over the radar and then i classify these three different type of supercell 
And uh, so methodology I use, like as I mentioned, that uh, I particularly use uh, the uh, balloon data, uh, which is mostly, uh, as I said, okay, three, two, two side from Alberta, two side from Manitoba, and uh, some of the side from other side of the border, that means the US side. And those uh, radio, uh, weather balloon data gives a, a, like a particular diagram, which we call uh, SQT log P, or uh, simply the thermodynamic diagram, where we can get a different kind of information, specifically a temperature and like a dynamical information and the uh, uh, thermodynamical information. And I compare the characteristics of these three different kinds of supercell. And from this picture, I'm showing the thermodynamical parameter comparison of these three different kinds of supercell. And which we clearly see that this LP, HP, and the classic supercell have the clearly uh, different uh, structure. Uh, so this is the thermodynamical. So as you can see from the right panel here, that uh, these three different uh, is giving a very characteristic different of these uh, uh, like uh, thermodynamic uh, variables. The same thing uh, for is true for a kinematical variable. That means variable related to wind. And as I mentioned that uh, in the during the in the atmosphere, because of the friction, as we go up, the fr friction decreases. The wind speed increases. So and at the same time, like the direction of the wind also changes. So this. Uh, like uh, speed shear and directional changes, uh, these uh, different uh, supercell also uh, form under different condition. And then actually uh, I also uh, compare, as I mentioned, that I not only see, uh, this is uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first comprehensive study over the Canada. So I try to compare how this Canadian uh, supercell is different from the US one. And then we, uh, you can clearly see that uh, specifically the blue is for all the Canadian statistics and the red is the from US statistics. And in, from this picture, you can clearly see there is a significant difference between the US uh, supercell times and the Canadian side. So specifically in the Canadian side, uh, this uh, supercell forms uh, relatively with lower values than the US. And until now, like, uh, like uh, as I said, okay, there is no other literature review. And so that is why like the operational uh, weather forecaster uses the information from the US. And based on this information, we they produces here the severe, uh, like a severe weather warning. And that is why like we may miss some of the uh, like uh, severe thunderstorms, uh, which forms under relatively lower environmental condition than US. So I think uh, from this conclusion, I, I can say that uh, we see that very clear difference between uh, these three different kinds of supercell over the Canada. So they form under different environmental condition. And uh, the second conclusion is that, uh, that we find a characteristic difference between uh, the supercell from over the Canadian prairies and as well as uh, in the, uh, like, uh, the north side or uh, south side of the border. And uh, that's all for uh, today. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. No time, no time for questions, but there's always time for tennis. Uh, where's Yinsung? Here. Hi. So uh, Yinsung's going to talk about uh, something about MCSs, and I just wanted to say that like 30 years ago, I actually wrote a paper on MCSs. Okay. okay. Just, just sharing. All right. Yep, so I think I'm the only one who prepared as flash talk. So I think I squeezed everything into three pages. So my topic is all about MCS. So MCS is a precipitation system that lasts longer than a few hours to up two days. So it normally uh, responsible for 50% of East of Rockies of precipitation. So it's quite important. So what I did is, uh, grabbing new data set, which is called um, ECMWF uh, reanalysis version five and CMIP six. So it is as new as iPhone 11 for era five, iPhone 13 for CMIP six is quite new data set. So previous versions are uh, over than 10 years. So um, that's basically what I grabbed. And for CMIP six, they came up with another scenario called SSP five, 8.5. So 
this one higher temperature is uh, SSP 5.5. So um, that's changing a little bit to pessimistic. So we don't really care about any of Tesla um, EV could, we don't like Cybertruck. Um, we value more Mustang instead of uh, electronic cars than we are ended up with that compared to RCP 8.5. And not only for the precipitation, we use a specific algorithm called MTD. So this one kind of distinguished long-lived MCS compared to precipitation. So this is quite different. So the left panel is showing the differences in future to uh, historical. So the left column is the forcing data and I will add the rightmost one, that's um, temperature, moisture, that kind of thing. So this is the result of uh, central United States. So the leftmost is observation. Uh, second column is uh, RFI, which is uh, present. The right column, like the third one is uh, future. So the interesting thing is uh, everything is shifting to the north, which is um, where we are at right now. So this one is based on 50, 15 years um, simulation added uh, 30 years of historical and future simulation. The right, pan, right figure is showing uh, what MCS looks like, but I think you're more interested what looks like in Canada. So this is Canada. So what most of us said, there's four sounding uh, locations in BC, one in Alberta, nothing here, two in Manitoba. So, uh, where over here, we have nothing. So two days ago, I saw um, the sky it seems interesting. So I tried to take a look at any soundings here, but I couldn't find it. So I just have radar data. So I didn't do any simulation yet, but this is something look like in the future. So um, I grabbed uh, the current simulation to the left. Um, 30 years uh, historical run would be second column. The future would be the third. The difference would, this would be the fourth. So um, this simulation would be sometime next year because I'm preparing comprehensive exam after this summer. So if anyone interested, let me know. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you very much. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, my project for my um, PhD program. And I'm basically concerned with water security and pollutant absorption from aqueous sources. And my pollutant I'm focusing on is sulfate. And biosorbents are basically really important to get a bit more um, sustainability into the absorption process and not just um, resins and other methods. So here, thankfully we have heard already why water security is such a big issue. And it's a global issue, not just confined to certain areas. And sulfate is a major contributor to water salinity and it's kind of non-toxic. So it's um, often overlooked. One nice tidbit is um, in the Everglades and the ecosystem, sulfate is linked to the methyl mercury production. Chemically, not at all whatsoever, but due to the um, microbial activities, it has been shown if you reduce sulfate, you reduce methyl mercury. So it's interlinked in many, many um, well, ecosystems and with other processes, despite um, not really appearing as dangerous. And the solubility is pretty high if you have sodium salts and others. And 
sulfate can be introduced via many processes such as weathering, especially um, in Saskatchewan and the Canadian basin here. Also mining, other discharge, and also global warming and water salinity um, exacerbates the issue. And then we have to basically address those issues. And here, this is basically chitosan. Chitosan is a really interesting biopolymer. In nature, usually um, it's found as chitin, fully acetylated, and chitosan is a derivative of it, which is very interesting. Here, um, you have those um, free amine groups after deacetylation. So those amine groups are what are uh, what's responsible for sulfate absorption. If you protonate them, you electrostatically absorb sulfate from the solution. So in chitosan is a renewable source. It's from food waste, from crustaceans mostly, but it can also um, be extracted from fungi and other biological sources. And it's the second most abundant biopolymer on earth. So it's just natural to focus on sul sulfate with chitosan as a biosorbent. So this is basically my project. So it's almost a three-pronged approach. First, uh, we have like bead systems for column application and the surface area is extremely low. The adsorption capacity and free active sites are really not good for sulfate adsorption. So we wanted to enhance um, the surface adsorption characteristics. We modified this chemically. We um, chelated calcium on it and showed that we can um, increase the sulfate adsorption capacity onto chitosan. So the problem is we still have chitosan relatively expensive. So we wanted to have a powder instead of beads, for example, with lower chitosan content, more versatility. And this is the second one here where we have a ternary composite. So we have chitosan as one component, we have alginate as the other biopolymer component linked via Lewis acid, which um, we posit as the active site for sulfate absorption. So what we showed here, depending on what kind of, let's say, aluminum salt you use during the synthesis, which is anchored so it doesn't leach into the water, so it's water secure, um, depending on the counter ion, you can address different anions from water. So if you use aluminum sulfate, obviously you can absorb fluoride and other um, anions. However, not sulfate, but if you change it to aluminum nitrate or aluminum chloride, suddenly you can absorb sulfate from water. The mechanism is anion exchange. So if you take up sulfate, you release, for example, chloride. So depending on the water applications, um, it's a trade-off. Uh, sometimes it's worth it, sometimes you have to consider it. And then the third approach, because water treatment, especially on a global level or in northern communities, might um, be cost prohibitive. So one major thing about um, chitosan and the third approach here, the physical plans is to make it really cost effective by upcyc um, upcycling waste materials, especially agricultural waste, locally produced, for example, can be used to dramatically reduce the cost while also synergistically working with chitosan to still have good absorption capacity. Going back to the beads, we have pure chitosan, but the accessibility of the active sites is low because it's only surface active. If we then use, let's say, agro waste and have less chitosan, but increased absorption capacity, it's a win-win situation. And that's basically, um, after having shown um, the absorption capacity of the first part, working on the middle part and now um, addressing the third part. So this is um, kind of my future work here. Um, this is the chemical modification, how it's done. So we cross-link um, the surface of chitosan with glutaraldehyde. It's a little bit toxic, so you really have to wash it. And then we chelated this. Um, Analytical chemistry showed, yes, we cross-linked this and in high enough concentrations, you can actually see this in the NMR, for example. Um, here, this is the ternary metal composite, as I mentioned, um, alginate, chitosan, and in this case, aluminum. And what's interesting is this can also be used for dye adsorption. 
So here um, we also showed neutral pH is the best for this material for sulfate adsorption and the dye adsorption also um, depends on what kind of counter ion there is. So we elucidated a little bit the structure function um, relationship of this material. And then, as I mentioned, the outlook um, going more into cost effectiveness, um, avoiding hazardous chemicals as much as possible and making the preparation cheaper. And then really go for the synergism. So if you have a inactive component, it might still work out to enhance sulfate uptake by exposing more adsorption site of chitosan to have yeah, more adsorption capacity. And then obviously, if you incorporate local um, agro waste materials, everyone has basically access to the local agriculture, can make those adsorbent in a cost-effective manner and not rely on expensive uh, synthetic resins, for example. Okay, that's basically it. Thank you very much. All right, if we can get going here so we can get back on track and have our lunch at the appropriate time would be great. So um, Jay and Mark made the unfortunate um, ask that I should run this session here, um, but that means I'm starting so I can talk for as long as I want and you just have to listen. Um, but I won't. Um, so I'm Philip Harder. I'm a research associate and I work with uh, Warren Helgeson and John Pomeroy. And so I'm going to give you some of the updates on what we've been up to um, and specifically around the aspects of coupling crop growth and cold regions hydrology and, and looking at it from some of the observations and modeling we're doing. So um, the context for all of this is that clearly we live in the prairies water and food are inextricably linked. Um, the one figure that I keep pulling up is this one here. So red is our spring wheat crop yields in Saskatchewan over time. We can clearly see that it's almost tripled in productivity, which is fantastic. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, but it's also quite linked to the variability we see in precipitation. So as we look forward to the future, um, how do we say pull together agriculture, which is clearly um, rapidly advancing in its various ways, agronomy, uh, genetics, um, all those factors. Um, and, but at the same time, it's very subjective to water. Uh, last year we had a drought, 60%, um, no, I can't remember, the 60% of total yield or a significant decrease in yield uh, last year because of incredible drought conditions and now we're flipping through to wet areas. Um, so there's three kind of themes that we have in our in the research that I'm doing. So one is looking at field-based observations, trying to quantify um, the crop water interactions, um, doing some model development. Can we simulate these things so that we can say go into the future and see what what we can manipulate in our practices to increase resiliency? Uh, and then UAV remote sensing to try and address some of the spatial variability aspects. So field-based observations, we've been busy with um, collecting data since 2015, um, where we've been trying to quantify crop, um, crop water balances over the growing season. So this is where we're trying to go out and directly measure evapotranspiration with edicovariance, precipitation, soil moisture as much as we can. Um, and we've got 19 site years and counting. Uh, and we've been really focused on quantifying dry land agriculture here at the Saskatoon here. Um, in addition to crop water balance type stuff, we try to collect as much data as we possibly can. And if you want to hear more about that, we can talk. At the end of the day, though, we want to synthesize some of this knowledge. And so this has been a focus lately. Um, 
And you know, this figure, these are growing season crop water balances, red being crop water use, uh, blue being our rainfall and green being uh, soil moisture change. Um, what we consistently see in the prairies, this is nothing new, is that we're water limited. Crops use all available water when they can. There are exceptions to that when we have deluges of precipitation, obviously. Um, and from when we start breaking it down, we can see that on average for these years, which is a drier period, 62% of crop water use came from rainfall, 12% um, came from soil moisture, and then we end up with this 26% residual. And I will just say there's a lot going on in this number. It doesn't mean we're doing things bad, it just means that things are more complicated than we want them to be. Things are not 1D. We've got scale mismatches between our observations, um, and then we have depressional um, hydrology in spatial variability of depression focused hydrology on the prairies that's inherent to everything. When we say step back and say, well, that was the growing season. Well, what about the winter? Um, because that is where 38% of our crop water use comes from. Um, we can quickly see differences between the precipitation that occurs, the snow that accumulates, what actually ends up in our soils to recharge things um, and provide that continuity in, in crop production. Um, and so there's, there's definitely inefficiencies from a water balance perspective that we can probably take care of, uh, to take advantage of to improve production moving forward. So you can't measure everything, so we also need to model things. Um, so we've been working on developing this cold regions agrohydrology model, which means that we need an acronym. So here we go with CRAM, um, which is basically slamming together cold regions hydrology model with a crop growth model. And with this, we can start simulating cold regions hydrology directly, as well as the water limited crop production outcomes that come from that. Um, to do this, we want to do this in a very process based manner so that we can start really simulating agricultural practices and what we can do to realize gains. And so one question we have is, for example, um, how does a stubble height influence yield because stubble height will influence snow accumulation, suppresses blowing snow, sublimation losses. It's a very significant term on the prairies. So in this case, let's simulate a barley from 2018 to 2021 and we'll vary stubble heights from five to 25 to 50 centimeters, which are within the range of possibilities pending many factors. Um, what you quickly come out with is understanding that there's significant nonlinear feedbacks between what our stubble height will influence in terms of snowpack, and well, that's on the top. Um, we can see that a very clear response is we have more runoff because there's no water available to melt in the springtime. Um, things get more nuanced when we get into the soil moisture aspect, um, but generally more stubble, higher soil moistures. And at the end of the day, what is the biomass or yield response to this? Well, if we increase our stubble heights from five to 25 centimeters in this case, we're increasing yield or biomass by three to 6%, which is not insignificant. But if we increase from five to 50%, we can have an increase in yield of between 10 to 32%. So there are opportunities here to increase the water available for food production because while we can't change the amount of precipitation, we can do things in terms of snow management. Um, just quickly, I'll touch on the remote sensing. So we've been doing a lot of UA-based remote, UAV-based remote sensing, primarily in two areas. Let's quantify crop growth, um, the physical characteristics over the landscape, uh, throw it together with some modeling, uh, energy balance type work, and we can come up with snapshots of crop water use and what this is really highlighting, and this is going back to, you know, the residuals that we can't close, is that we have a lot of spatial variability um, due to depression-focused prairie hydrology that have land atmosphere feedbacks. And so this is a lot of work in terms of trying to inform our point scale observations to generalize um, to, to broader extents. Um, and so then I'll leave off with we've got some work with precision egg that we wanna try and apply some of this work with. So this spring, we, we part, we're partnering with a precision egg company and they went out and drove our fields and we were getting maps of uh, electrical connectivity and, and trying to see 
some of the synergies that we have between some of our fundamental crop water use, spatial variability work, and some of the technologies that we have available now um, that are being implemented to look at the spatial variability of crop water use in a more commercial um, deployed already uh, precision ag product. So I'll stop there. Okay, and I, I have two minutes for questions. Awesome work, Phil. Really amazing. Um, I wonder if in the agricultural community, which you're a part of, do people talk about snow farming as like a thing? Like, are they trying to actively manage how much snow stays on their property? It depends where you are. Um, so areas that are much more prone to moisture deficits, um, southwestern Saskatchewan, southern Alberta, um, where snow is a big, much more important component of your water balance. Uh, there's definitely awareness of that um, and that there is sensitivities that we can take advantage of to make things better. Uh, there's a lot of work has been done in the past on it, um, but it's, it's kind of interesting because you go from a wet period, people don't care about it so much. We enter a dry period, our, our production practices have slightly drifted in that meantime. And so now there's this always, there's a bit of a lag between um, say how we're managing our stubble to what we're in at the moment, because there is often, you know, things are wet. We don't want snow in the landscape. So we're gonna remove our stubble or cut things low. Um, so there's, there's a bit of a lag there. Um, and yeah, a bit of that, there is knowledge there, but we can do better. We're not translating these kinds of understandings to, to some of the pr production practices that are, are being, are, are ever evolving, I guess. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Well, in that case, we are going to, yeah, Jian Lu, um, talking about agricultural water management in Norway. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, Philip, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm talking about uh, agricultural water management in Norway. So uh, maybe you are wondering why I'm talking about Norway, but uh, uh, it's basically because I'm uh, getting a new position there at the uh, Norwegian Institute of uh, Bioeconomy Research. It's uh, located in a small town called Os. It's like about 30 kilometers south to Oslo. Uh, so first I want to talk about a little bit uh, uh, about the facts about Norway. So uh, as you may know that Norway is located very north and is the southmost point has a latitude of 57 degrees and Saskatoon, the latitude is actually just 52. Uh, and Norway, the national land area is a little bit uh, uh, bigger than half of Saskatchewan, uh, and it has five million people. Uh, and for the land use, uh, Norway has about 3% uh, agricultural land and 7% lakes and uh, uh, glaciers. And the rest of the nation is basically uh, forest and, and mountains. And uh, Norway has a maritime climate. It has uh, mild winters and uh, uh, cool summers. So the winter in Oslo, for example, is very similar to Toronto, uh, but the summer in Oslo is like similar to Yellowknife. So you can imagine how it uh, looks like there. Uh, so there are uh, several challenges for agricultural water management in Norway. And the first is uh, uh, water quality. Actually, Norway has pretty good uh, water quality. It's, uh, uh, it is actually much better than uh, many European countries. Uh, for, you, you may have heard of the, is, uh, there's a Vos 
bottled water uh, in the in shops, and that is actually bottled in the southern part of Norway. Uh, but uh, still, uh, Norway has eutrophication problems in lakes and rivers. It's basically driven by phosphorus. Uh, and uh, Norway has very high uh, precipitation in many areas, as shown in this uh, smaller map on the right. Is in the western coast, uh, there are many areas they could have annual rainfall more than uh, 2,500 millimeter. So that's very high. Uh, and uh, agriculture is an area of concern for water quality. Uh, that's because the, in uh, most of those areas with the water quality problems, they are basically actually agricultural regions. And for the agriculture, the main concerns include uh, soil erosion uh, and also manure and fertilizer applications in agricultural land. And also, uh, especially the, they have vegetable and uh, potato productions and the farmers tend to use a lot of fertilizers or manures on this kind of land. Uh, but on the other hand, now we also have uh, water quantity problems uh, in many areas is both too much water and the lack of water is just because the rain uh, occurs mostly in the fall or winter when the crops don't need uh, uh, water. And uh, uh, especially in the eastern part of Norway where annual rainfall is uh, pretty low or relatively low, it uh, can be like under 500 millimeter. So yeah, uh, there are about 60% of the agricultural land is artificially drained there and the irrigation is needed for many areas, especially for vegetable production. Uh, and also like in Canada, Norway also has a climate change challenge. Uh, it's predicted uh, they will have more extreme weather events uh, with a higher rainfall and the more uh, intense precipitation episodes and an increase in runoff, soil erosion, and phosphorus loss. And also the, this climate change will lead to greater uncertainty in the efficiency of mitigation strategies. Uh, so to handle these kind of challenges, uh, Norway has started a, a, a national agricultural and environmental monitoring program since 1992. And so basically they have identified 13 uh, agricultural agriculture dominated uh, catch, catchments across the country. Uh, so they basically monitor the agricultural management practices and the uh, nutrient and pesticide losses, stream, uh, stream flow uh, in these watersheds. And these watersheds really cover a wide range of crops uh, there, like including grass, vegetables, uh, grain crops, fruit, potatoes, etc. Uh, so, uh, so I have uh, uh, talked a little bit with my colleagues there. So uh, probably I would uh, start with uh, some uh, products related, uh, for example, uh, revisiting regulations related to livestock manure applications. And also uh, I would be involved in a national phosphorus and a nitrogen modeling for improving water quality. And also they have just got an EU funded project um, uh, it, it, uh, about, uh, it's about the collaborations between EU and China for uh, sustainable nutrient management. And it's a pretty big project. So I will probably be involved there somehow. Uh, so in this project, uh, uh, we will deal with uh, management, uh, nutrient management to uh, mitigate uh, nutrient losses to the air, water, and, and also to improve soil quality. Uh, with that, um, uh, I, I should say I would be happy to bridge the, any future collaborations between JWS and uh, NIBIO uh, there on water research or nutrient research, if there are any future possibilities. Uh, and in the last, I would like yeah, I welcome any questions or comments. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, 
we, we've got time for questions if we anyone has for Jeanne. Well, it's news to me that you're going to Norway. So this is <laughs> exciting for you, sad for us. <laughs> no questions? Okay. Uh, then we'll move on to, to how are you? There you are. Yeah, and we're going to be modeling synergistic effects of climate change and wetland drainage on Canadian prairie stream flow. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Philip. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Zhuhua He, and I'm a postdoctor working with uh, Professor John Pomeroy and uh, Dr. Chris Spence. Uh, today I'm going to uh, introduce uh, our progress on modeling the combined effect of water management and climate changes on the Kindia Prairie stream flow. Um, this work is supported by the Prairie Water Project and the Global Water Futures Program. And uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Shock and uh, Corin Whitefield also contributed to this work. So uh, we mod modeled the stream flow sensitivities uh, in the seven classes uh, of the prior basins. And uh, the basins was cl uh, classified by uh, Jed uh, Wolf uh, and his course paper published in uh, 2019. And this figure showed the locations of the seven classes. Uh, so we can see the uh, high elevation grassland uh, in the west and uh, the uh, interior grassland and, uh, and uh, uh, part of, uh, uh, glacial costume and the uh, sloped inside as well as the uh, part of teal class in the center and the major river valley class and the source and uh, Manitoba class in the east. And we are using a virtual basin modeling approach uh, in the seven classes to uh, do the hydrology modeling. And uh, the water basin has a size of 100 square kilometers. And uh, uh, to try to uh, represent uh, the most common land covers in the prairies. Uh, the land covers uh, in the uh, uh, water basin include uh, uh, cropland, uh, grassland, uh, forest, uh, uh, shrubland, uh, fallow, uh, the wetland complex, and the uh, water bodies and the trail. Um, in the, in the ups, uh, downstream. And these two figures show the routing orders of the different uh, uh, land covers. And the land, land covers were uh, represented at, a, at different HIUs in the green model uh, called the region hydrology model. And the, the different HIUs were, uh, were uh, featured by different uh, uh, depression storage uh, capacity in the model. And uh, this figure is showing the performance of the model in simulating stream flow. And then we combine the, uh, the simulations and the observation of the WSC stations in all the seven classes. And uh, here I just show the result for three classes, uh, uh, include the slope the inside and uh, the portal class and the southern morning Toba class at, uh, at uh, three different uh, stations. So we can see the model simulated the ranges of the annual stream flow uh, of the observed annual stream flow well, especially in the slope inside and the southern Manitoba uh, class. And also the model simulated the uh, seasonality of the stream flow uh, uh, well and in, in, com, uh, in, in terms of the, the, flag, flag, uh, dif, uh, the dynamics in the different months. For example, both the stream flow uh, simulation and observation show that uh, there are very small stream flow in the season from autumn to uh, winter. And also both stream, uh, simulations and observations show that uh, the stream flow mainly occurred in the melting season from uh, March to May. So then we are using this model as a tool to investigate the stream flow sensitivities. And uh, we set up a couple of scenarios. So for the uh, water management, we consider uh, uh, drainage and restorations and for the rest of the we assume that the wetland area was reduced by 
a 10% to or 100% of visitor increment of 10%. And uh, for the re uh, veteran restoration, we assumed that uh, the veteran was uh, uh, veteran area was uh, expanded by 20% to 40% in the model. And for the temperature perturbation scenarios, we assume that the temperature will warm by one degree to six degrees based on the baseline uh, climate. And also the, for the uh, precipitation uh, perturbation, we assume the change uh, the future uh, uh, precipitation will change from 80% to 130% of the baseline um, uh, precipitation. So then we have the results. So uh, first the model by the different scenarios, and then we have the results. So firstly, uh, we have the results for the uh, uh, stream flow sensitivity to the metal measurement. And um, here I just showed the uh, compare the results in three classes, uh, include the high elevation grassland uh, HEG and the pH uh, perturbation uh, class, uh, tier, uh, class PHT and the major river valley uh, class uh, major MRV. So uh, we can see uh, the basins in the potential class show the largest sensitivities uh, of, uh, of stream flow to the veteran area changes. And uh, that is uh, much larger than the sensitivities in the, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, high elevation class and the major river valley class. And the meanwhile, we can see the stream flow tends to show larger sensitivities to veteran uh, drainage, that means the uh, a smaller one, a uh, uh, smaller uh, veteran area, but then that uh, to the sensitivity to the veteran restoration, which means that the uh, veteran area uh, increase. And uh, then is the sensitivities to the uh, precipitation changes. So we can see uh, the positive classes, basins in that class show the largest sensitivities followed by the major river class and the high elevation class and they show the uh, smaller sensitivities to the pit, uh, precipitation change. And the last uh, finally is the sensitivity to temperature. So, uh, in, uh, so in this uh, situation, so we can see however, the high elevation is uh, grassland class show the largest uh, sensitivities to temperature warming, but uh, uh, the major river valley and, uh, class show the smallest sensitivities. Uh, so uh, we have the combined effect of the different uh, scenarios of uh, meter management and the uh, uh, precipitation and temperature perturbations. So here is an example of the uh, results in the uh, Portadillo class at the Yorkton station. So we can see the stream flow uh, increase with the veteran drainage and the uh, increase in the precipitation from 80% to 130%. And uh, we can also see the uh, decrease in the stream flow with the temperature warming and the rest veteran restoration and the, the uh, increase in the uh, 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 decrease in the precipitation. And uh, in this uh, uh, at this station, we can see the maximum uh, increase in the stream flow uh, due to temperature warm, uh, precipitation rising and the temperature uh, uh, veteran uh, energy would be up to uh, four hundred and four hundred percent. But the, the maximum decrease in the annual stream flow only due to temperature warming and the reduced precipitation and the return restoration could only be up, up to 80% in this uh, at this station. Uh, so yeah, this is our updates and uh, uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in either our out model or the pools and also the uh, model is setting up, we are, please feel free to uh, contact us uh, through email or other approach. And our model has uh, other pools, uh, a lot only stream flow, but also other uh, variables, uh, hydraulic variables like the uh, soil moisture uh, through melt and uh, evapotranspiration or through uh, accumulation like that. So if you are interested, please feel free to connect us. Yeah, thanks. We have time for questions if anyone has any. Yes, not. So thank you. Um, we're now going to move to Gahavami um, talking about prairie performance for HABS communication. Are they here? No. No show. Okay. 
Um, then I think this is Monica next, and we're going to talk about story sprints and knowledge mobilization for uh, GWF. You've got extra time, so you can just go as long as you want. Oh, boy. <laughs> Thanks very much. A bit of a change of, uh, of topic and style. As most of you know, the Global Water Futures Program is producing very exciting cutting edge scientific research that just begs to be widely interpreted and shared to demonstrate its strong relevance pressing climate change and resource management challenges facing Canada and other regions. We're moving sort of up a level here to be quite broad. We have 20 odd more months of Global Water Futures uh, funded work. It's moving into its final phase and now it's time to really share the program networks, research findings and methods with broader audiences, both within and beyond academia. I know many of you have been doing research and sharing among yourselves, and some of you have been sharing very well with audiences that are really beyond uh, the academia, but we need to really up our, our efforts in this area now that we're on the home stretch. So these findings need to be presented in accessible formats that highlight both the scientific and technical implications of the research and the interactions that have led to strengthened and new relationships that are producing more conversations among water stakeholders and further development of vital solutions. Pointing out how the research is transformative, which means it's leading to essential structural changes in management and governance and, and inclusive, which incorporates other knowledges and social interests is a priority. While the science is hard to do, as we've seen this morning, some examples, Demonstrating its transformative and inclusive nature is another challenge altogether. Global Water Futures achievement of transdisciplinary inquiry and, and uh, knowledge mobilization formulated at its inception five, six years ago needs to be clearly demonstrated to its funders and to the resultant and the resultant rich learning shared with others who are facing the challenges of implementing similar programs. A little background first, as a team, the mobilization, uh, uh, knowledge mobilization folks have been, had two layers of work, what we call horizontal programming, the services we offer as a whole team to the program, and then the vertical programming to offer specific support to projects as per their knowledge mobilization plans. Most of this is work has, been, has taken place with my colleagues, my predecessor, um, but now, so of these, of these, our work has fallen into four themes. To increase, to increase the appreciation of knowledge mobilization, to support the fostering of internal and external relationships, to create a toolbox of best practices for improving knowledge mobilization, and to document the research impact outcomes. Now you notice the items on the right are highlighted. They should be highlighted. They don't look like it to me here, but the items on the right is what's important now because we're moving on from trying to build the capacity of our science teams to interact and communicate with potential users uh, of their project research. Our focus for the next 20 odd months is capturing the learning from these efforts and synthesizing project outputs to reflect the real life impact outcomes of Global Water Futures work. So it's time for consolidation. These are the approaches we're talking about as we head into the Global Water Futures final stages. Awareness, access, legitimacy, credibility, trust, and understanding are needed for successful uptake of new knowledge. The best way to, to achieve these is for scientists and potential users to work together at the point of problem. 
to enable true co-creation of knowledge, whether it be looking through the same microscope or through hours of policy discussions. Global Water Futures was designed to facilitate this, and there have been many, many opportunities for this to happen over the past five years. They're kind of invisible. We need to make them visible. Strengthening the science policy interface is building on patiently cultivated relationships. Sharing synthesis will aggregate the work of Global Water Futures, 500 researchers and partners to make sense of the work of 39 May projects and to find a way to tell the story so it resonates with various audiences. This next one is really what I've come to talk to you about today. This is making relevance visible, the relevance of research visible through capturing researcher user interactions. Because the interactions that take place between researchers and potential knowledge users are key in co-creation, Global Water Futures Knowledge Mobilization Work Plan includes a series of creation workshops that document this process. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that now. Uh, winning hearts and minds, using the power of visual art, fiction, lived experience and poetry to raise awareness, increase understanding and encourage reflection about the need for science. Preserving, so, so some of this has been done already. Witness the, uh, the art exhibition that just took place in Canmore. We need more of it because that's a very quick way into understanding complex issues. And last, preserving and promoting and pivoting on institutional memory. Climate change has given us a reminder that we need to learn from previous experience. The only way that's possible is if we preserve it through stewardship of data and its context and make it available for others to build upon. So I'm not going into those other issues today because I really want to make a call here for collaboration and in a specific area. And that's making re relevance of your research visible through sharing researcher knowledge user interactions. Right, transdisciplinary research moves beyond building interdisciplinary teams of researchers who work together to build shared language and frames of reference to include potential users of research in the planning and implementation of research projects. The need for transdisciplinary research has become clear with the increasing challenges that rapid climate and social change are bringing. Those wicked problems that take an entire society with multiple types of knowledge to solve. Involving non-scientists in research processes is not always easy. I'm sure you, you found this. But interactions that take place between researchers and potential knowledge users are key in co-creation of new knowledge as they are part of the often elusive science policy interface. Sometimes these interactions are captured and documented in formal project processes, but often they're lost in the labor intensive and time pressured activity needed to collect analyze and publish data. Accounts of these interactions are considered anecdotal and therefore non-essential, but often these interactions are signals of creativity and a new understanding that moves the research in a new direction. So what's it all about? We are planning rapid production of accessible stories in a variety of formats that reflect the actual experience of Global Water Futures project researchers while interacting with knowledge users. Working with Secretariat and partner university communication staff, we will assemble and deploy a support team over the course of several days to work directly with pairs of principal investigators and selected young scientists. We propose to produce these products through the story sprint approach where subject specialists who are the researchers work closely with a professional production support team consisting of a facilitator, fact checker, documentalist, writer, editor, illustrator, data analyst and designer in a workshop environment with access to a variety of creative software applications over a short period of several days. Researchers are invited to participate with the understanding that they will leave the workshop with a product in hand. An initial training session introduces the researchers to crafting stories, as opposed to technical reports, scientific articles, 
and case studies. And it provides guidance in identification of experiential story cores. Researchers then draft their narratives and review the content with other participants and the production support team, moving on once satisfied to collective collaborative creation of the formatted project. Okay, what's the story kernel? It's the starting point that's based on a memorable event that can take place anywhere along the research project pipeline. So we're not looking here for your findings. We're not looking here for your methodology. We're looking for events, small events that are memorable to you because they shifted something. They shifted your, your understanding of the research. They shifted the understanding of the user uh, of the research. And, it, and we're looking for these events that happen anywhere along the research project pipeline from the formulation of the research proposal right through to the publication and follow-up of the research. And these small events, these memorable, memorable events lead to insights or actions. The Story Sprints approach encourages participants to reflect on all stages of the project pipeline and recall these memorable encounters with potential knowledge users that led to more engagement or further development of their thinking about the project. I've got two examples here. Have I got time to, to, to give them to you? Um, just to give you an idea. Do I have time, Mark? Where are you? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so the first example is in identifying, is at the stage of the research pipeline where you're identifying research priorities. And the second example is uh, at the stage of getting knowledge user feedback about science recommendations. The first example, a young, this comes from my, my African experience. A young PhD biology candidate was sent by his American professor to liaise with government officials in a Southern African country where the professor had been carrying out field work for some years about the social lives of baboons. It was really good research, very, very uh, groundbreaking. The profession had, professor had run into some resistance on the part of the government officials to renewing his research permit and wanted the young student to convince the officials to allow him to move forward with his field work. The assumptions being that the PhD student would participate in this. So he sent the PhD student off to Africa to do these negotiations. After sitting down in the office of the responsible government official, the student heard from the official, why are you studying these animals? What good does it do for us here? Now what you should be doing is studying those vermin, those wild dogs who are killing our cattle. They're a real pest. The student went home to mull this over. To make a longer story shorter, almost 30 years later, he runs an established conservation research program in that country, focused on the preservation of wild dogs. Sadly, perhaps the permit for baboon research was canceled. So there that shows a major shift in research priorities that came from a single encounter with a research user. Second story, a researcher working on problems caused by drainage of water in prairie potholes was leaving a meeting, this is pre-COVID. As he headed for his car in the parking lot, he bumped into a man who was loading his farm truck with fertilizer. They got talking about the current drought conditions in the province and the farmer asked the scientist about the meeting that had just taken place. When he heard about the work the scientists were doing, he expressed interest and the researcher invited him to the next project advisory committee meeting. The farmer became a committee member and made regular contributions in the form of comments about the research findings from the point of view of a practitioner farmer. So those are examples of what we're trying to, to get from you guys. What are we building towards? What's the result after the end of two or three days of, of intensive work? What are you going to walk away with? Well, there are all kinds of possibilities. I can't think you can see them on the screen there. How do we see these knowledge projects be, products being used? First, the experience of the researchers who are engaged in the production process in itself is a key outcome. The participants will gain a greater pre appreciation for the transdisciplinary process and reflect on broader use of their study results. Story Sprint's teams will decide on the initial formats for their stories, 
But then using the story kernels, there will be opportunities to repackage the stories for other audiences and channels. This is really just an initial list. The opportunities are many and our intention is to, to pair uh, the principal investigators with younger researchers because we know the younger researchers have good experience with, with uh, different formats of communication. So in brief, that's what it is. And we want to know what your story kernel is. We really want to hear from you. So it's, this is a collaborative effort between the knowledge mobilization team and communications. There are three names there on the slide. You're welcome to contact any of us. Uh, we're looking at having a pilot uh, for these workshops sometime within the next month or so. So please come to us, contact us, and uh, let's see what we can produce to further enlighten the world. Thank you. Any questions? That was fantastic. Thanks, Monica. Um, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. I don't think I'm going to. So, you know, we're supposed to, uh, <clears throat> I'm supposed to deliver closing remarks and then we're supposed to break for lunch, but there's no lunch. Uh, lunch is coming in 10 minutes. So um, I'll just say a few things. First of all, it is um, super obvious that we are not used to having in-person meetings because no one is asking any questions. So, you know, drink some coffee and have a, you know, have a nice lunch and uh, let's all try to ask, a, you know, at least a couple of questions if, if there's time, a couple of questions per, per talk in the afternoon and, you know, we can, we can do it. Um, really um, amazing morning, really appreciated hearing from the students and um, and the talks in the last session were, were great. I encourage you on the science communication part to really uh, try to engage with, with Monica. I think this is a great idea. Um, you know, there's some key themes that are, that I think we started with in the morning and finished with in the morning. And that is communication in addition to doing the great research, letting people know about it. And so that means telling the stories in different ways. And what Monica talked about, I think is super important. So if you're involved in any of, uh, the GWF projects, like most of us are, please, please give it some, please give it some thought and uh, go to the workshop. And it's too important. Um, it's great that we've had an incredibly well-funded research program, and that we published a bunch of papers. And you know, we're seeing all the great research, and it's really groundbreaking. But it's not going to help us if people don't know about it, if taxpayers don't know about it, if our decision makers, policy makers, elected officials don't, don't know about it. And this kind of storytelling, this makes it really, really easily uh, digested. So I really encourage you to, uh, to do that. Uh, what do we have, like nine minutes now, Michelle? Uh, I could tell some jokes, but I don't know any. Um, I, you know, didn't bring any musical instruments. So I suggest instead that we, yes, summon. Yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, question. Let's just 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 talk. Yeah. Okay. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Simon. Thank yeah, you so much. This is a much. great initiative. I mean, of course, we all know that science education is now so so important, and you know there is a lot of pseudoscience in particular out there. And when you get to talk to your neighbor, then you hear. You hear some things that doesn't make sense to you, and then you go and try to search. Okay, what kind? Where that kind of science is coming from? And then you, know, you realize, okay, there is a lot of channels or a lot of untapped potential there uh, that we can tap onto to do more. And of course, we scientists, our top priority is paper publications, and that's how we are being evaluated. But then at some point, you realize, you know, what you want to educate people around you as well. And what they've been spending a lot of time myself during the pandemic was to be on YouTube, for example, just watching, subscribing to different channels, getting notifications going. 
watch those. And I noticed during this time that there are a good number of science education, science education type channels, that some of which promote pseudoscience with millions of views. And you know what, so I had put videos on YouTube before, and if, if it was lucky, I could get 100, 200 views at best. But of course, you sometimes see weird stuff on YouTube getting going viral, many basically views. And then I've been just watching in the past six months or so some of these science education channels. And uh, uh, of course, a lot of it didn't make sense to me. But then I thought, you know what, perhaps we need to sit together and think how we can basically create videos that instead of getting 100 views can get 10,000 views or more. And I think that is where Monica's efforts come in. in. And then uh, I just wonder what you think, Monica, in that sense, what we can do. And I've established a YouTube channel myself with the hope that I can do something with your help, Jay, and others. Uh, but, you know, I, I think there's great potential there, and we've done a lot of research in, as a group, and if we could plan out for some very plain language videos that explain some complex stuff to the society, so we can even inform public opinion, and as a result, inform policy at some point. I get to have the microphone while I bring this over to Monica and just say microphone courier. Yes. Um, Simone, we are we are working on this and we're very happy to be out of COVID. Um, we have a series of videos that we're, we're going to be working on and they're basically called explainer videos. Now, these are short ones. Um, and our plan is to have anyone who wants to be able to do this uh, come into the media production studios or record with us somewhere on campus. And we're gonna make some really great videos that are you know, short bits, like one minute, but we also have some platforms now like our What About Water platform. And with these story sprint ideas and with the GWF legacy pieces where we really wanna produce this really great content that's coming from a very reputable source like our Institute and from, from the university. Uh, so I'm really glad to hear that there's appetite for that. And maybe Monica has some more thoughts on this. So just to, just to say that uh, some of the work that's going on already from the Institute is really valuable. The uh, Women in Water series, the, um, um, the, the podcast, all of these feed into the, the big ocean of, of information that's out there. And uh, what we found is that the best way to get lots more attention is to piggyback on a current issue or somebody else's remarkable findings and to uh, start a conversation around that. But two things that we should really mention, I think, Mark, one is the Science Features, which is a series of, uh, of kind of explainer articles that people have been working on through Global Water Futures. And we've recently had a new one posted about, about genetic e eDNA, eDNA, yeah. And uh, again, really good stuff, well explained, really good visuals, really good graphics, but how to get it out there and how to get more people to know about it. There's a real fight for attention in this online world and we have mm -hmm. to think about ways. So thanks for that suggestion. Uh, the other issue we we're talking about recently is that because Global Water Futures is in its, uh, in its home stretch, the, people are a little bit tired and uh, when perhaps started out some years ago doing frequent social media posts uh, have kind of slowed down a bit. And we really, really want to revitalize your use of social media. It's a cheap and fast way of getting information out and getting people talking about what you do. Philip Harder, wherever he is. Um, yes, he, he is a, a rock star in my estimation for his social media work. Please have a look at his Twitter feed. Uh, you know, I can, I can follow it. I can't follow everything, but I certainly read everything. And uh, it, it's, it's a sign. If someone like me with a humanities background can follow it, then he's doing a good job. So have a look at that. Think about your own use of social media. Uh, at the end of this month, uh, University of Saskatchewan's research, uh, research division, research support division, I haven't got it right. Yeah, is, uh, is sponsoring a social media for researchers uh, webinar. Please participate. 
it's, it'll be a good refresher for you. If you, some of the projects that started more recently with Global Water Futures don't have a Twitter account. Uh, there's nothing to stop people from setting up a new account from, or from reposting and from reposting what other um, Institute and Global Water Futures um, uh, researchers are posting. So yeah, re-engage, re-engage. This is an important phase of a big network program like this, really important. And the impact that we can have at this point will lead on to opportunities for everybody in this room. Thank you. Four to five minutes to go. So following on on that theme. So uh, yeah, the burnout's a really big, uh, so you mentioned a couple of things that really resonated with me. One is the burnout. Um, and so, you know, I don't know how the Institute can incentivize those of you here to participate. I mean, maybe we have a, you know, do it before barbecue or something like that, or give you chocolates or something. I, I don't know. We'll figure, uh, we need to uh, encourage you to do it, but also keep in mind that um, a project like this needs to be documented beyond the documentation in the literature. Sure, we can always put together great volumes of papers and reports and things, and, and, we, and we should. Um, but I think it needs to be documented in these translatable, accessible ways, because again, we had a program, it's not over, but it's almost over, that was actually at the pace and the scale, right, required to deal with the water problems at, at the national scale. Um, so, um, you know, we can see the finish line and it's time for that last kick, you know. Um, so that was one thing I wanted to say. The other thing is a clearly just killing time. And if you see the food roll in, just tell me. Just did it roll in? Yes, question. Oh, I love you, man. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, good. Um, yeah, I just also want to mention on this video theme or short video theme, uh, we have... Um, our catalog of projects uh, with, with everything from uh, project information all the way through to where you can download data. Uh, but also added to that now is a, a story record that can be associated with anything. So it could oh, be nice. a, a project, nice. it could be a data set. So now if you wanna really give that impact, yep. it will eventually have uh, an index of all videos uh, and you can you can upload to the system easily, uh, and uh, you don't have to worry about social media, YouTube. You'd, you'd have to get a good video going and make it nice and short. And that's where Mark and uh, Monica and, and other people would come in. But this is another final resting place that's uh, right with the data. That is really great to to hear about. It's great to have that have that connection between the data sets and between the stories. So that's wonderful. Um, the one other theme I wanted to get back to, which sort of um, follows on from what Monica and, uh, and Saman were saying is, you know, how do you get people's attention? And we all, we all struggle with that. Uh, it's a complicated, it's a complicated world. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and um, it's, um, you know, with respect to climate change, I think things like uh, CO2 and fossil fuel burning, and you know, they deserve a tremendous amount of attention and they get it. But at some level, I think water's been sort of number two uh, on the attention on the attention list. And so, um, I don't know how we crack that, and I don't know how we um, better compete for attention. I think having quality materials out there is good. I think social media helps to some degree, but I don't know, you know, does anyone else have any ideas or are you just like too hungry? Like, you know, how do, yes, I'm in. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, maybe, maybe having uh, like pages, our web pages in other languages would help. Maybe. Ah, yes. Like, I like uh, that translation. French, Spanish, maybe a little bit of Arabic. Maybe. Mm, yes, I think that's really good. Really good. And it just occurred to me, you know, having champions who can like sort of retweet this stuff 
in different parts of the world um, can also can also help. So great, great suggestion. I can get that translation uh, comment can also feed into YouTube channel. And because I've seen some science education channels with multiple versions, basically yeah. translating their own videos in different languages. We already have GIWS YouTube channel with thousands of subscribers, but we can think of how we can make it to millions, first of all. And I think seeing the glass half full past two years, many of us have learned to use how to use technology. Now I can create videos at my home and I've posted on YouTube just a couple of months ago. And you know, it took me a lot of time actually, but now I think I'm a video editor myself. And I think uh, now we have some experience, we can sit together, we can find ways how we can create viral videos based on science. And there are yes. some good examples I've seen in the YouTube and we can look at them and see what they did that, to become that successful. Yeah. And you know what, typically they are made but by non-scientists, but we are scientists, so we can do better. Thank you, Simon. It's good now? Oh, we're good to go. Uh, I awesome. got one more question, but Wait. Jay, you've, act, you've also, uh, you've helped us kind of build a, a portfolio or a suite of gear that we have available to. So we have mini drones that you can take out. Um, so we'll make those available to anyone who wants to take them. You don't need a license for the mini drones and they have, the technology has come so far in the last few years. Um, and we have good SLR cameras as well, DSLR cameras. We've got so stuff. We've got stuff. So, we, you know, come, yeah. come find us at the Institute and we'll make sure you have the gear you need yeah. when you're in the field or if you want to do something. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, like, uh, thanks, uh, Saman, uh, for uh, emphasizing putting uh, the research in different social networking mediums. Uh, I just want to say one more thing. Like, uh, I think, uh, we need like a student needs some motivation or the proper, the faculty member should encourage their student uh, to communicate their research into different social networking uh, platforms depending on the audience like uh, for me let's say uh, facebook is the most popular social networking medium in bangladesh but to, uh, in Western here in the US and Canada, we have the scientific community most active in the Twitter. So again, uh, so it need to be uh, customized uh, depending on the region. Mm -hmm. If you, like uh, in Bangladesh, if I tweet the same event in Twitter, it never get retweeted one or twice. But when I share something in my Facebook, it gets thousands of share in mm -hmm. Bangladesh. Yeah. So it good. is again one thing. Good suggestion. Yeah, no, really good. Um, okay, Mark, what time do we need to reconvene? 12.45. Lunch here. Follow there, go. Lunch time. Thanks everybody for a great morning.